Glynn says Neff had recommended this cautious approach due to a recent spike in cases. In recent days, Neffet has had a growing concern regarding the increase in cases of this disease with an increasing proportion in younger people, a number of which were linked to large clusters. We now believe that the reproductive number has exceeded one and our 14-day incidence has risen from a low of 2.5 per 100,000 to 3.9 per 100,000 today. The family of George Floyd, who died while in police custody in May, are suing the city of Minneapolis and the officers charged over his death. Derek Chauvin, who was sacked after the incident, is charged with several offences, including second-degree murder. Three colleagues who were also fired are charged with aiding and abetting. Finally for now, Johnny Depp's former estate manager has told the UK High Court he found a piece of flesh in the star's home. Ben King says he was there to clean up the day after the actor injured his finger during an argument with Amber Heard. The 57-year-old is suing the son for libel after it printed an article claiming he was violent towards his ex-wife, something he has denied. That's it for now. We'll have more at 10. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. For our lowest car insurance price guaranteed, go online to the AA.ie. Mostly cloudy with patchy drizzle, mainly over the north and east. It will stay mild and humid tonight, though, with some showers affecting counties along the west coast. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off the Ball with Paddy Power. Remember sport, that thing you used to love? It's back. Gamble responsibly. See I'm prepared to edit the well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why well, should there be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Well, later on in the football show, we'll talk to Jerry Armstrong, who is obviously right across the Liga. Real Madrid, two points from winning the title. They will play tomorrow evening and should uh, win the title ahead of Barcelona. They started lockdown, or they ended, they began their project restart, as uh, the Spanish version was, behind Barcelona. But uh, with Barca struggling, Real have cruised through, and they're now on the cusp of winning La Liga. As for Gareth Bale, he's been on the bench five games in a row. It would seem his relationship with Zinedine Zidane is as fractious as ever. And he was pretending to be asleep in the stands for one game. For another game, he was pretending to watch the game through binoculars. I'm not really sure exactly why, but it's aggravated the Real Madrid fan base who are already not so sure about Bale, to say the least. So we'll talk to Jerry about all of that later on and, and just where Bale's standing at the club is. His contract goes to 2022. Very shortly, we'll talk to Adam Pope. He is of BBC Leeds, who themselves are on the cusp of a return to the Premier League. They have a game tomorrow, which should pretty much give or take as all but see them home. They have been away from the Premier League for 16 seasons, and now they are potentially coming back under Marcelo Bielsa. So we'll talk to Adam Pope. I'm sure they're pretty happy in Leeds. Uh, Before all that, though, full times from the Premier League this evening, if you didn't catch the results. Manchester City were up against Bournemouth. This was at the Etihad, as was Peter Smith. A battle won off the pitch on Monday for City and another win on the field. And a 10th consecutive Premier League success over Bournemouth with a now aggregate scoreline of 30 goals to 5. After strikes from David Silva and Gabriel Jesus, City didn't expend much energy in the second half and they almost paid the price with a late Bournemouth rally. A substitute, David Brooks, offered genuine hope. Battling qualities they'll need going into their final two games still cut adrift in the relegation zone. City 2, Bournemouth 1. Result of the evening probably came at St James's Park. Stephen Goldsmith there. Newcastle 1, Tottenham 3. Jose Mourinho has finally won a league game at Newcastle after 15 years, 8 games and 3 different clubs. He looked to the bench in despair at one point during the game when an out of sorts looking Harry Kane made a hash of a chance. But Kane is a deadly striker and proceeded to put two headers away, adding to Son's first half goal and restoring their lead after Ritchie had levelled things up. Newcastle 1, Tottenham 3. The other early game was a turf moor. It was Burnley against Wolves. Adam Jory was at that game. Wolves bid for a top four finish. Now looks to be in tatters after being held by Burnley. In truth, they didn't really do enough in the match to warrant all three points, but Jimenez's strike appeared to be the winner. It looked as though Burnley's mounting injuries amidst the rigorous schedule had finally took its toll as they failed to find another gear. But Chris Wood, who moments earlier had missed a sitter, scored a penalty under pressure that may well have handed them an outside chance in their own bid for European football with just two games to go. There we are. That is uh, the roundup of the three early games in the Premier League. As things stand, just before the break at the Emirates, we've had another goal 
and it's gone the way of Arsenal. Nelson has scored in the 44th minute. Arsenal were 1-0 down in this game. Mane had scored in 20 minutes. Lacazette equalised on 32 minutes. And now Nelson has scored to make a 2-1 Arsenal and it's just gone now half time. So Arsenal in the lead against Liverpool this evening at the Emirates. Let's turn to Leeds United. Adam Pope of BBC Leeds is with us. Evening, Adam. Hey, Joe. So you're all happy. Things are moving very nicely. I, the result you wanted this evening didn't quite go the way uh, Leeds would have liked in that Brentford beat Preston. So what exactly do Leeds have to do and how likely are they to mess it up at this stage? Ah, well, there's two very, very different questions. Yeah. I mean, firstly, we were sort of hoping that, uh, probably against hope, that Brentford would slip up tonight because it meant that would have meant that Leeds could have gone up tomorrow. As it stands, they can't mathematically with a win over Barnes tomorrow night, who are the bottom club, of course. What it does mean, though, Joe Whitley, if Leeds did win against Barnes tomorrow, then they could actually get promoted without kicking another ball before they get to Derby on Sunday because it means there's no margin for error for West Brom, who play at Huddersfield on Friday night, nor for Brentford, who play at Stoke on Saturday in the lunchtime kickoff. So, yeah, a win tomorrow night, as you say, virtually has them there. They need four points or, or, or somehow to get a four-point advantage over those two rivals in the next three games. You'd think they'd do it, but hmm. it's Leeds, Joe. <laughs> there's always a twist. There is, Joe, but I mean, th this year, it's in my mind, they have become the best team, not just the most attractive team, they've become the best team in 25 wins so far. Um, they are in really, really good form. They just had that little blip at the beginning of the restart against Cardiff, which was nothing more than a bit of rustiness. But since then, they've been pretty overwhelming, very unlucky to drop two points at home to Luton. And then against Swansea, fantastic last minute win. Just wish the fans were there for it and, you know, demolished Stoke. Did really well against Fulham, despite being on the back foot, even at 1-0 up. But Pablo Hernandez has been the man. Three 45-minute cameos for him, Joe. And he's totally put this season back in Leeds United's hands, if it wasn't already. Mm. Are they a markedly better side this year than last? I think they're stronger. I think they're more robust. They play exactly the same way, Joe. And it's pretty much the same players, is it not? You know, Patrick Bamford, still up front. You know, he gets criticised for missing a lot of chances, but he's only one shy of his record total in the championship. He's on 16 at the moment. He had 17 with Middlesbrough. Sadly, Calvin Phillips is injured for the rest of the season. He's been an absolute mainstay. They call him the Yorkshire Perlow here. That's his. That's been his influence and his maturity in the way that he's developed under Marcelo Bielsa. So very, very much the same squad. If you're looking at the new players that, that have come in, it's Ben White has been a phenomenon. Pontus Janssen went to Brentford, where he's doing a great job, of course. But Ben White, if they could keep him should they go up, then they have a Premier League quality player right there. He's been superb. But... You know, if you're picking a man of the season, um, Stuart Dallas has kicked on again. I mean, nine out of ten every week and has become a consummate defender, having arrived as a winger. Um, you know, th there you go. Same players, had two years of Bielsa, and now some of them look like they're Premier League ready. Mm. How are Leeds United finances these days? Do they, do they, like, have they spent big over the last two, three, four, five years to get to this position, Bielsa aside? Do you know what? Their, their finances, in terms of... FFP or, or PNS, uh, they were on the cusp, but they've handled it quite well. And I'll give you an example there. The, the, the club still loses money, so Radrazani, the owner, still has to, you know, write a check out to keep funding the, the losses, despite having what fifty million pound revenues, or that's what it will be next time around. The wage bill's got up. You know, massively, it's gone up from. If you remember Chilino's days, they that was sort of like twelve, thirteen million pounds sort of year. Now. All things considered, you're up near 40 million. Mm. And that is sort of what they felt that they needed to do if they were to compete right at the top end of the championship. So it does lose money. But however you think, if they go up, then the revenues that come, obviously, as we know, with the broadcast rights, the commercial rights, everything else, will soon see leads into a profit. So they're, they're a pretty clean club these days compared to where they were a long time ago. They were saddled with huge debts for a long, long time, but uh, Rajasani's whittled them down well, to be fair. OK, that's well and truly behind them. So, I mean, a Premier League spot for a start is £100 million in the bank. It's celebration time. It's just incredible amount of revenue to receive overnight. Will they spend big, do we suspect? Well, I don't think they will. And and sort of the, the example that I'll give you there would be, like, say, Helder Costa. They bought him over a period of time from Wolves. He's going to be £60 million in the summer. And what they did, instead of buying him, say, for 14 or 15 million pounds sort of straight up, they made sure that they, if the impact falls into the next year, 
so that if they were to stay in the championship, then it means that they won't be uh, hammered when it comes to FFP next time around. So I don't think they'll be spending, you know, hundreds of millions like Aston Villa did on players. I think they need to spend on a keeper. They need two more strikers, I would say. We don't know what's going to happen with Augustin, the guy from Leipzig who's loan-ended, and we understand that there is an obligation to buy him should they get promoted, but he's featured for 45 minutes. That could be £18 million. Pound. Could be down the drain if they have to pay it, if he isn't going to come back or if he isn't going to perform. Mm. And I think, you know, they're probably going to need another number 10 because Hernandez is brilliant, but can he still do it for another year at 35, going on 36 into the Premier League. So a new spine is, is, is what they'll need. But I don't think they'll be spending massive, Joe, to be quite honest. I really don't. Mm. When we've talked to you over the last couple of years with Bielsa and with Leeds falling short, we have maybe wondered if tiredness had hit the squad. And you, I don't think, have been of the opinion that that was the issue. Now, this season, obviously, the pandemic intervened, and so we don't know to what extent they may or may not have benefited from arrest. <laughs> so that will still, for the, for the begrudgers out there, that will still be a question mark next season. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I don't agree with it, as you know, because mm. the stats show differently. And, and Bielsa has talked at length to us about that, saying everybody's still running harder, faster, longer, quicker, stronger than, than the opposition. Last year, I think it was more of a case of they just imploded at a crucial time. You know, it was just handling the pressure of it all, really, in a mad 20 minutes. If you think about it, Joe, ahead of the, the break, you know, they drew at Brentford and then they won their next five games without conceding a goal. Mm. So they went into the suspension because of COVID in really good form. And to be fair, they've come out of it by that one game where they looked a little bit sluggish. And, and to be fair, in, in recent games, you can see the championship is taking its toll with these nine games in such, such a quick succession. But I still think they are a massively fit side. I mean, they overwhelmed Fulham in the second half. They battered Stoke the other week. And, and look, one of my moments of the season, Joe, and this sums up the fitness, Luke Ailey picks the ball up. 90th minute at Swansea, he's on his own goal line, receives a short pass from the goalkeeper, puffs his cheeks, pulls the oxygen in, legs it up the right wing, big one-two, cut back and Hernandez scores. That's the difference between Leeds and the other side. That's what makes you champions. Mm. And I know you've always been very strong in that point and I haven't had a strong opinion either way because I'm not watching them week in, week out to have mm. that kind of a, an opinion. But if nothing else, you would say, well, these players have adjusted to Bielsa demands at this stage anyway, if, if there was an initial issue. Yeah, they have. And like I said before, you know, you're two years in now, so they know what to expect. It's still very difficult. It's still the murder ball sessions that we talked about, I think, last time I was on, where mm. they play intense 11 against 11. Um, you know, something <laughs> during the suspension, of course, they were they were gagging to get back to. But it really is a tough, tough and, and strenuous regime. And if you don't get up to speed, and it's very difficult for players coming in in January. Look at John kevin Augustin, you know, coming in from Leipzig, you know, via Monaco. He's not got down to the weight. He took an injury in February, maybe has recovered, but has just not got into the rhythm of it. And hence, his services are not needed at, at this time. And, and that just shows you how difficult it is to get, to get up to speed halfway through a season. You really do need that pre-season with Bielsa, I feel, and, uh, you know, to be able to sort of match his standards. Mm. So I presume Elland Road is rocking these days. Is it full houses? Are the good times back? Is there a, a sense of excitement about the whole thing? There must be. Well, there was until, until we couldn't have the fans back of course, in, of course. Yeah. And, and this is this is the great sadness. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we've we've noticed it more as I, I do the commentary with with, with Noel Whelan, the the ex player mm. uh, with, with Leeds, and uh, when and and he's a lively guy, and, and I'm glad for it because he's he helps fill you know an echoey bowl. And and the, the the last game we did away at Swansea in particular, whether it was the acoustics more than anything, it was really noticeable that you know there was no fans to celebrate Hernandez scoring a late winner. Similarly at Blackburn, where you know Calvin Phillips scored an absolutely wonderful goal, and normally you turn away to what they call the Darwin end of Blackburn, and there's eight thousand Leeds fans mm. traditionally make that journey across the Pennines into into Lancashire. That has been a huge miss. And also the other thing, as we know, you know, Big Jack has died, Big Norman has died, mm. Trevor Cherry has died, and the fans haven't been there to be able to pay their respects. You know, the flags are there inside the stadium. Leeds have been really classy in how they've done it, and so have other clubs too, and particularly around Big Jack, you know, this this last weekend. Um, and it's been really, so on two fronts, it's been really noticeable and really poignant and really sad that this, what should be one of the greatest moments in the club's history, cannot be celebrated in the proper way. Pre-pandemic, what was it like at Ellen Road this season? 
Oh, Joe, awesome. I mean, it's been Bielsa without trying to court the headlines or court the publicity, you know, he wants it to reflect off his players onto the onto the fans, if you like, you know, all the all the sort of goodness. He he has re-engaged the city and got everybody just just so on side with the with the club. I mean there were other times before, you know, Gary Monk managed to do it for a good while too, before that season has sort of petered out. But Bielsa has done it in such a way that he's absolutely adored and revered. People are so proud of their football club. I mean, I'm not saying that they always went, but seriously, the amount of shirts that are worn, the amount of pride people take in their club, the way that they talk about the way the football's played and how they love this this head coach who they just think is, is already a legend, you know. And uh, if you can just get this over the line, then this club is ready to explain explode it really is and, and and come back you know with all its swag and it's all as you know nobody likes us we don't care sort of attitude back into the premier league where let's face it they might not like them but they do want them mm, no absolutely they're a brilliant story to have back in the league i'm not sure when you first pitched up at leeds or worked in leeds but i would think post the uh, you know incredible fall that just self combustion i i would presume there would have been many in the city absolutely livid with the football club and angry at the football club Oh, there was a, a phrase used, and I think it's some of the Twitter handle called Fear and Loathing in LS11, the postcode of Beeson, where it is. And, and under the Bates regime, for Ken Bates regime, for quite a significant period, and also under Massimo Cellino, too, um, one of the previous owners, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of infighting. You know, fans groups were having to literally take to march in the city centre to the ground to try and force some change. Football was awful. Um, you know, there was one, I'm trying to think now, since I started doing it in 05-06 when they lost to that in the playoff final to Watford at, at Cardiff, the Millennium Stadium, there's probably been one season of real note in that time and that was beating Manchester United in the FA Cup in, in under Simon Grayson the same year that they made it up out of League One into the Championship uh, on the last day in, in typical sort of lead style, if you like. So other than that, there's been so little other than two seventh place finishes in last year's you know, playoff defeat to Derby, which was utter heartache. So um, it's time, and they deserve it. They really do. That These fans deserve it because they uh, their support is superb, Joe. And if anybody goes to Element, there are no loads come across from Ireland. Mm. It is absolutely unique, not just there, but when they go away too. They really make everything an event. And uh, it, it's it's great because as a commentator, Joe, and, and you'll notice, as well, you, you sort of ride off the crowd too and the vibe that you get. And all that isn't there at the moment. And it's particularly noticeable with Leeds. No, I'm sure. And what of Bielsa in the midst of all of this and across the season generally? I, I wouldn't say he's made massive headlines. There's certainly been no Spygate this year, that's for sure. <laughs> How has he been week to week? Yeah, he, the, you're right. There hasn't been any of that sort of off-field stuff to, to affect him. The, the only thing I would say that has, has been, and it's not really him either, it was, of course, the Kiko Kassir situation, who was, by the FA, found him guilty of, a, you know, racially abusing the, the Charlton strike or the Charlton Lone East striker, Jonathan Lacko. He's actually available to play now. His band's finished and is available to play tomorrow. So that's probably the only big off-field issue that, that Leeds are sort of having to contend with. But as far as Bielsa is concerned, no, there's been no Spygate. There's been nothing at all contentious. And he has just carried on in the same way, his own humble way. And I tell you what, he's handled the whole COVID crisis really, really sort of low-key. The whole return with you know nine games in a short period of time, having to play last after all the rivals again. I mean, this will be the third time in a well, the second time in a row, and then the third time will be on Sunday at Derby too. And he handles all that so well, never makes an excuse out of that or the referees or, or anything that goes against him. Um, conducts himself with utter, utter class. And I've got to say, Joe, th this season, if he couldn't have done it any more last season, it's just added so much more value into the into the squad. You know, Ben White, who's on loan from Brighton, and Calvin Phillips, genuinely being talked about by Gareth Southgate in dispatches with regards to next year's European Championships. He does improve play players, Bielsa, doesn't he? Joe, he, he does look I immeasurably so. I think Calvin Phillips is the one. And it's so sad that the local lad won't be able to see out the last three games. He has become the ultimate defensive midfielder. Breaks up, starts stuff, passes stuff, gets the odd goal. He's he's brilliant. What he's done with him, he's found him the position that others were almost there with because he's played at the top of a diamond. He's played in midfield, etc. But he can play defensive midfield and as a and as a 
sort of auxiliary centre back as well. And he's just got it out of him from the start. And that is probably the finest bit of coaching I've seen. But Stuart Dallas, I'm not joking, he is a defender now. Whereas when he first had to defend, when he was sort of put in as a makeshift, it was a real struggle for him. But he is a superb defender and is holding down left back in particular really, really well. And is keeping Barry Douglas, who's a, you know an out-and-out left back, Gianni Alioski, the Macedonian international, who starts as a winger but is a left back for his country. Dallas is quite rightly keeping them out because he's been turned into a superb defender by, by the coach. Mm. Every time you're on, I do a quick Google of Marcelo Bielsa just to see if he's <laughs> said anything of interest or check in what, what's going on. And invariably, somewhere on that first page of Google, I find a new article which tells me stuff about Bielsa I didn't know. And it's always just amazingly colourful. So TalkSport had a piece of them today. And it has nuggets like this. Uh, from his days at Newell's Old Boys. And Newell's were trashed 6-0 by San Lorenzo in the Copa Libertadores. South America's answer to the Champions League. That night, a gang of 20 incensed ultras turned up at Bielsa's home, demanding he come out to face them. When he emerged at the door, he did so clutching a grenade. If you don't leave, he said, I will pull the pin. It was this incident that popularised the nickname for Bielsa, El Loco, the crazy one. <laughs> no. Joe, it's a great story, isn't it? And tell me it's do true. You... Don't you dare tell me it's not true. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's true. I mean, his... The El Loco title, which can mean quite a few different things, but obviously to us it means, you know, the mad one. We don't see any of that. I mean, it, what we see is a humble guy with an iron will to commit himself to his philosophy of how to play football and aesthetically pleasing style of football, which he hoped, literally, I think, he just wants to bring to the masses. And the masses are the Leeds fans in a traditional sort of northern city, if you like, but a one-club city, and to bring them joy into lives that might otherwise have very little joy. That's the, how he speaks. That's how he feels. That's how he's so passionate. So I can understand him doing what he did. You know, as you say, walking out with a grenade, I just can't see him doing it now, maybe <laughs> 20 years ago or 10 years ago when he's seen the footage. But he, his attitude is he's like, Corinthian, it's like an amateur attitude. He wants his players to play for the love of the game, and 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 that's what is beautiful for him. You know, that's mm. it, it's not the winning really. Winning is a happy byproduct. It's how you win, how you make people better, and if you can make a difference to people's lives. He looks at football in a much more, if you like, um, you know, global term rather than. I honestly think he's trying to protect the game going forward. You know, he's talked about having to save the game from from the world that exists around football at the moment. Mm. And we've got to be very careful with it. And that's why you see some of the great humble acts that he does and, and the really noble stuff. It's like giving, you know, the goal back to Aston Villa last season, for mm. etc. Yeah. And his work rate is astounding. I mean, that was one of the ancillary parts to Spygate was it, we got a glimpse of the detail he goes into. And, you know, famously, I think when the Leeds uh, executive people went over to Argentina to try and secure his services. He had watched every single one of their league fixtures from the previous <laughs> season. He was able to list formations they used by opponent across a 46-game season. By all accounts, he can watch and analyse two games at once. He's perfected that art. And there was a depth to him. So this piece in TalkSport I mentioned, it said here that when he stood down as coach of Argentina in 04, he went to live in a monastery with nuns for three months without a phone or television. There he read voraciously, reflected on his guilt, frustration and embarrassment at failing to guide the national team to anything greater than an Olympic gold medal. Soon after, he retreated to his farm where he continued to live in relative an anonymity for three years. During his time away from football, Bright Lights, he continued to study the game. He would take breaks for regular exercise. One day he came across a man whose wife had left him for another and taken all their possessions. Though he was not in need of houseworkers, Bielsa offered to pay the man to prepare lunch for them both every day until he had enough money to get his life back on track. It goes on in this vein. Uh, the point I'm making is he has a depth to him, he has a social conscience to him. Oh, absolutely he does. And look what he did with, with his, 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 the club he loves, New old boys. You know, the way he donated that money to build the, if you like, what we'd probably call an academy or the hotel there, which was uh, named after his great mentor, Jorge Griefer, as well. And that's the sort of measure of the man. You know, this is a man, as you say, who has who paid the, the Spygate fine himself. You know, he wouldn't want anybody to know that. This is the man who thought this would be a great idea if, and again, he didn't want this to get out, but it did, 
to get the players to pick up little at the beginning of last season for a length of time that was commensurate with the time that fans would have to work so that they could pay for a ticket to go and watch those very same players play. Who could get away with that unless mm. people bought into him and, and believed in him? Uh, you're right, he has a, a huge depth and a and I, what I look his relationship with the media is we do it all in one. There's no one-on-one -on -one stuff that's been well documented. His relationship with with the fans and the public is is incredible. He stops, he gives his time, he'll have selfies, distance as they may be at the moment. He will chat to fans and be very open with them. He's very open with the press, I think, to be honest, too. Um, I, I love that. There's, there's a transparency about him that you don't see with other, with other coaches. And it, what I would say, Joe, as well, you can ask him anything on football about why he made substitutions, why he's done this, why he's putting this player there, will he be doing this, using this player in this position? And he will talk to you and discuss, and he does not make you feel like you don't know what you're asking about or talking about. He's he's great. He wants to talk about the football, and it's really refreshing. What he doesn't like is the constant barrage of some press, I think, in the past, who tried to go for what he calls the polemic and trying to get the divisive sort of, you know, the, the stuff that's really contentious or whether they're always looking for, you know, a, a little bit of an, a, an abrasive ankle, which which will probably come in the Premier League, which will probably come with Leeds United. Um, but I think that's why the relationship with everybody, and particularly the local press, is, is that we, we talk about on-pitch stuff and it's great. It's such a change at Leeds United to be able to do that, Jan. Mm. Well, I mean, like, it's a privilege for you guys to be able to throw Marcelo Bielsa, who Pep has said is the greatest coach in the world, to throw him football questions, that he's willing to answer them and indulge us idiots. I mean, gee, what, a, what a privilege. <laughs> uh, that may be one of the question marks as we begin to wrap up our conversation here, Adam. That may be one of the question marks hanging over how Leeds uh, might do. I don't want to say will do. Uh, let's uh, make sure they qualify for, or, or they uh, win the championship first. But how they might do in the Premier League next season. Bielsa's temperament under the glare of national media. They will be gone for sensational stories. He will be hit with whatever the issue of the day is and it'll be in Sky Sports News and any misstep will be magnified. And as we know from his history, he ain't afraid to pack up his bags and walk away at strange moments. No, and, and in that light, Joe, we have to enjoy every minute that, that he's, he's at Leeds United because he's been a benefit to, to the to football in general in, in, here you know he really has he's 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 raised the standard so it is always I'll, I'll be honest it's in the back of my mind you know Lazio they failed to deliver their promises he walked after two days um so so far so good and there's been a few tests on the way if you think about it Joe Ronaldo Vieira really promising midfield it was sold literally you know weeks into his into his uh, first summer at Leeds, or just towards the end of that first summer to Sampdoria. Not an ideal situation. He said that if he'd stayed another year, I would have doubled his value, you know, rather than the seven million or whatever it was he went for. So he didn't go on the back of that. That was obviously being discussed. Leeds had been straight with him. And then the whole Spygate thing, which you mentioned again before, you know, I, I as a report, I've got to be honest, being objective, I thought the way he was treated was disgusting because I still don't think he did anything wrong and to be fined and punished for something that was uh, had no rule or law until retrospectively was really bad. And he, again, I thought, well, could he walk on the back of that if he's being called a cheat or this, that and the other? Um, he didn't. He stayed and, and he's seen it through. So, But you're right. I think the times he has got rattled is either when... There has been a maybe the odd story and he's just completely disagreed or he feels that he's being mocked um, and sometimes that does come down to a mistranslation here or there um, and what we have actually said is that we absolutely appreciate the time that you give us to talk about football um, when he might consider itself to be a bit technical, a bit boring, we say, no, it's really important. But I think others have sort of mocked him sometimes for the depths that he's gone to. And I think that's um, that sometimes has gotten his goat a little bit, along with a few other things. But ultimately, no, he's been he's been a, a real act of class throughout. And, and I just hope that, you know, if this squad does go into the Premier League, the only way really you can see them actually sort of staying up quite well would be making sure that he stays. Mm. Well, look, here's hoping we'll have a full house at Ellen Road next season, Manchester United in town, the place going ballistic, and, you know, everything that Leeds can bring to the party would be great. Uh, before you go, very finally, uh, you mentioned Big Jack. I mean, there was such an outpouring over here. He's, a, he's an icon. You know, he re really is over here. He, there was a time he was probably the most famous person 
in the country there or thereabouts for a period. Uh, it's such a pity that, you know, it wasn't a big crowd at Ellen Road to uh, pay some kind of tribute. But um, we, in the city, is it, like, here everyone knows him because of the Ireland stuff, and that's more recent. Would a, would a 20, 30-year-old be aware of Big Jack and 20 seasons at Leeds? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Probably not in the sense of how revered he was or how much of a part of the, the great golden age of Leeds he was. People know he was one of the, the World Cup winners. Mm. They won't, what they won't realise, Joe, is what a really good player he was. He was self-deprecating. Obviously, you've heard him talk yeah. in the past. I won the ball and gave it to those that could play sort of attitude. You don't play 773 times for the best side in England for a long, long time. Win a World Cup and then manage at a high level without being very good at playing the sport because that gives you the kudos to go on to be a really good manager. And oh, it doesn't work for everybody. It didn't work for his brother Bobby. But So the younger generation probably won't get it. For people like me who's in my early 50s, mm. I don't remember as a player. You know, it was like 73 when he was retired. What I remember him was doing coaching on television and being really engaging. And then, of course, we all remember Italia 90 and, and USA 94. And... And, I mean, phenomenal. And then, you know, to have a statue at Cork, you know, with him fishing. And this guy stands across the IOC as a, a footballing giant. Mm. And, and and I'm really glad that that has been recognised by so many people. I mean, you know, he's, you know we, he met the Pope. You know, he's um, he was funny. He was engaging. His grandchildren talk about him in a way that's so glowing that this he was a funny sort of giant. He was belligerent. Um, but... What a, what a guy. I mean, what a career, what a life he had. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. And mm. and to revitalise Ireland or Irish football or give them, you know, untold heights at that time, you know, that's probably how, like, Chile look at Bielsa, isn't it? Mm. For, you know, and then to, to some extent, you know, Argentina as well, you know, for whom he won Olympic gold. You, you, that, this is what you're talking, this is one of football's great, great iconic people mm. and it's so sad that uh, that we can't you know remember him in quite the way that we want to or pay our respects in the way we want to adam pope bbc leeds thanks so much adam much appreciated good to talk to you joe yeah likewise so uh, i suspect we'll be talking to adam a whole lot more across next season once leeds uh, don't screw this up in spectacular fashion uh, i should tell you at the emirates still arsenal two liverpool one liverpool by the way i've just seen the goals there while chatting to adam they replayed them on the tv Two disastrous goals to give away. Van Dijk in the most uncharacteristic fashion, just uh, dispossessed on the edge of the area and a gift of a goal. And then the other Arsenal goal came from a Liverpool throw-in. You know, again, similar situation. They're very near their own penalty area. Throw comes in. They're dispossessed far too easily and two really bad goals to give away. So 2-1 Arsenal, 61 minutes on the clock. We're talking to Jerry Armstrong about Spanish football next. This time, Messing is onside, and it's an identical chip from the young substitute. Brilliant! And Barcelona wrap it up in style in the Camp Nou. Messi. Oh, brilliant skill from Lionel Messi. Surging forward with real menace here. Brilliant from Messi. Oh, what a goal! time with 20 minutes to go. Brilliant ball from Badiger. Is this the opener? Yes, it is! That's what they came to see. And he's provided the touch. His arms have reached up to the gods. Stylish finish, which Maradona himself would have been proud of. Albert inside. It's Messi!
Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. When you've watched more Belarusia Premier League than is healthy, proper football is back. Gamble responsibly. See Dunleary.net. News Talk Breakfast. There's no good reason to build a five-bedroom house out in the middle of nowhere. Build it in Kilgarvan and breathe a bit of life back into Kilgarvan. I don't claim to be speaking for people in rural Ireland. I am speaking for people in rural Ireland and people who want to be part of our countryside. And when we're talking about protecting species, I want to protect all species, including the human species who want to live in rural areas. There is nothing wrong with wanting to keep a light on in the countryside. News Talk Breakfast. In association with air. Weekday mornings at 7 on News Talk. From teaching them how to ride a bike to brushing their teeth, life lessons really matter. Teaching kids about money is one of the most important. That's where Ulster Bank's Money Sense can help. An online hub with free interactive content to help kids aged 5 to 18 make sense of money. It also has great tips for parents on how to equip their kids with positive money skills that can last a lifetime. Search Ulster Bank Money Sense today. Ulster Bank. Help for what matters. Ulster Bank Ireland DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. From the apartment in the city to the cottage in the country, at Energia, we're the power behind a quarter of a million customers across Ireland. And right now, there's never been a better time to join us and save on your electricity and gas with our cheapest dual fuel bundle. Wherever you're living, know you always get the biggest savings by coming direct to us. Go direct to energia.ie and switch today. Energia, the power behind your savings. EAB 1,364 euro based on average annual usage, 12-month contract, discounted unit rates, standing charge, PSO, levy and carbon tax, T's and C's and early termination fee apply. Valid from June 2020 and subject to change. Verification in T's and C's at energia.ie forward slash EAB. Give your home some love this summer with Harvey Norman. We have big deals across our huge range of furniture, beds and homewares with something for every room of your home. Save up to 1,000 euro on our beautiful range of corner sofas. Support local manufacturing with up to 50% off all Irish made mattresses and get up to 100 euro off our huge range of designer mirrors. Shop safely in our spacious stores or online for these deals and more. Love your home again with Harvey Norman, your furniture and bedding specialists. Petrol, diesel, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, electric, which one do you choose? At the Society of the Irish Motor Industry, we're here to help. We know different drivers have different needs, so we provide clear, simple advice on the benefits of each technology. Whether you're buying a new 202 or a used car, talk to your local SIMI retailer. Drive cleaner, drive greener. To find out more, visit simi.ie slash drive greener. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. When you've seen West Ham beat Preston in the 1963 FA Cup final for the sixth time, live football is back. Gamble responsibly, see dunlewy.net. Welcome back. Still Arsenal 2, Liverpool 1. We're turning to Spanish football tomorrow evening. Real Madrid can wrap up La Liga. We have Jerry Armstrong with us. Evening, Jerry. Hi, good evening, Joe. So I think we spoke with yourself and Dermot Corrigan just as La Liga was about to restart. At that stage, Madrid were behind Barcelona and you said to us you had a strong sneaking suspicion that Real Madrid would catch them and overtake them and win the league. So you're sitting pretty right now. Yeah, well, it was a question of the strongs. I knew Barcelona didn't have as strong a squad as Real Madrid and Real Madrid... uh, certainly had a lot of players who were almost fit coming back after injuries, including uh, the, the, the Mallorcan player who has come back and, and started scoring goals for them. But Benzema's on fire. He's scoring goals for fun. He's only three goals behind Lionel Messi, who's sitting on 22 goals. He's with a cheat sheet. But just think they had a better squad. And there's a lot of problems at Barcelona at the moment. They've dropped points they shouldn't have dropped. And Kike sets in. The manager's under pro- uh, pressure. So, uh it's not been good for, for Barcelona, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, the story is every bit as much about how bad Barcelona have become by their standards as however good Real Madrid have been, because this has not been a vintage La Liga season. <laughs> no, it hasn't, but, it, you know, the, one of the goals the other night was scored by Mendy, and he's their 21st goal scorer this season, and it shows you how extensive they are when they've got that quality. One of the star players for Mallorca this season is a guy called Take Kubo, a Japanese a player who's 18, 19 years of age and has been sensational. And he was loaned from Real Madrid to, obviously, to Mallorca to play, and he was their outstanding player this season. So they have real strength and depth, whereas I think 
Barcelona really need to rebuild this summer. And uh, I don't know where that's going to take them, but if they're going to keep in touch with Real Madrid, they certainly have to spend money and get the right players. And how strong, Jerry, is Real Madrid's first 11? Like, do they have a stellar 11? Yeah, they've very straightforward stellar 11. They've got a very solid back four. I mean, Sergio Ramos is still the captain. He's an ever-present. I know he's getting older, but he is so consistent. Uh, they can interchange the full-backs at will. They've got a quality midfield. Sometimes they play Modric. Sometimes even Gareth Bale plays. He wasn't playing last night. He was on the bench. But, you know, they've got quite an extensive squad. And um, I, I just feel that uh, they've got more quality than anybody else and more strength and depth. And that's why I fancied them to win the league. So how will they go against Man City then? That's the other question mark. They still have the second leg to play. Well, they're 2-1 they're down. Yes, I think, obviously, Manchester City, after losing the title to Liverpool, will be looking to bounce back. Now, equally so, Manchester City have a fabulous squad. Mm. And certainly Pep Guardiola will be looking to uh, add more trophies to his hall. Uh, and I would say Manchester City certainly are in the driving seat now because you would fancy them to, to score again. Um, Real Madrid have a wonderful history. Nobody has won the Champions League more than Real Madrid. And Zidane would love to get a fourth, a fourth title. But um, it's a difficult one, especially after the teams coming back from the... The lockdown, it depends on their, their, their focus and playing behind closed doors is difficult for players, I know that. So uh, it's not an easy one to call, but Manchester City, I think, have a slight edge. On Zidane, this is a ludicrous question to ask, obviously, given what he's achieved as a manager, but he's never talked about as a great tactician and sometimes people wonder, well, what does he really do day to day? Uh, to your eye, Zidane as a manager, tactician, how he manipulates a team, how he maybe makes substitutions and changes games. What's your sense of how good this guy is? Because his record, obviously, is ridiculous. But uh, there has been the question mark over, you know, maybe in a way Ancelotti gets this as well to a point. You know, what, how much yes. is he doing day to day? It's a good question, Joe. Well, actually, you know, and I've watched it on for many, many years. I loved him as a player. Mm. He was a fantastic player. But you and I both know just because you're a great player doesn't mean you're going to be a great manager. And that was one of the questions. But it's, he seems to command so much respect. And he seems to be obviously know his players and pick his players and, and get the best out of his players. You know, I was chatting to a, a, a TV company in Asia this morning and talking to them about Johan Cruyff and what he could deliver. And he was a wonderful player as well. But he was also a really good tactician. And he wanted to play attractive attacking football, which is you know, the ethos of, of Real Madrid. They want to play attacking football and they have the players to do it. So he gives them the confidence and belief in themselves to go out and play. That's why you can never, ever uh, rule them out. I think that there are anybody who rules Real Madrid out are foolish, but you know, it's hit and miss with them, and especially after a lockdown situation. Yeah, but I mean, but, you know, John Cruyff, Cruyff's a visionary. Uh, Zidane, for a start, you wouldn't say Real Madrid play exhilarating football by the standards that they might be uh, expecting, you know, the fans. It's, it's, it's pretty rudimentary at times and hard to beat at times, no? It is. I mean, I, I'm still trying to work out. I thought Gareth Bale would have had a run out yesterday. I thought he had a chance of playing and, uh, you know, he didn't. He was sitting on the bench and, uh, you know, the, the, the press seemed to pick on him a lot, but he doesn't seem to care. Um, they, they've got some very, very good players. Marco Asensio is the New York player who was over the cruciate ligament injury and he's played in quite a few of the games. But he came back straight from an injury after being out for like four, five, six months and he's scoring goals. He's actually put the ball in the back of the net. He's, you know, and he's back to his, his normal form. So he seems to know or has a gut feeling about a player, mm. whether he's uh, 100%. I think that's what it is. It's an instinct on the player as to whether he's up for it or not. Okay. And he's, he's been pretty good so far, I have to say. Well, his instinct on Bale is pretty clear. I mean, uh, this is just a conundrum at this stage. Uh, Bale, by the way, is still, I was reading, Guillaume Balaga had a piece, he's still the fifth highest goal scorer at Real Madrid in the 21st century. So Gareth Bale has still, in so much as he may be labelled a bit of a flop over there, has still scored 105 goals for Real Madrid in 250-odd games. He's going to win his second La Liga title. And at that moment, Jerry Armstrong is gone. You're gone, Jerry, I presume. I'll finish my point anyway and we'll take a short break. But Bale is about to win his second La Liga title. He has four Champions League medals to his name. Four Champions League medals to his name. And maybe scored the greatest goal in the Champions League final against Liverpool. It's up there with Zidane's potentially. And it just seems like he's been 
uh, cast aside, really, so you may not have seen it. He was pretending to be asleep in the stands against Alaves. He had a mask over his eyes and he got slammed by the press. And then at the most recent game, he wasn't brought on as a sub. He's been on the bench for the last five games in a row. He was pretending to watch the game through binoculars as some kind of a joke. And the press are all over him. But it seems he's going to sit it out, is uh, the point. 600 grand per week, his contract expires in 2022. So uh, that's the general situation with Bale. I'm told you're back, Jerry. are you? Yes, I am ah, back. Right, okay. Sorry, well, well, sorry I've been rabbiting on to myself here and the listeners just explaining <laughs> the Bale situation. I won't repeat all of it. In short, I highlighted how, on paper, his Madrid career is stunning. Four Champions Leagues, etc., second league title. Um, there's the stuff, you know, him pretending to be asleep. There's him watching the game through binoculars. The press don't like him, clearly. Yeah. Zidane has had him on the bench the last five games in a row. They wanted to sell him, it seemed, at the start of the season. Uh, you just don't really understand, I don't anyway, why this thing hasn't quite worked out the last couple of years. Oh, well, last summer he was due to go to China. It was yeah. a big deal. He was going to earn a million pound a game or a million euros a game. And um, they were losing 2 0 in a pre season game. I was actually commentating on it. And they brought me along in the second half. And he scored a goal and made a goal. And he turned it around for them. So the president and the rest of the director said, no, he's not going. The next day they pulled the plug. So I don't think Gareth Bale was too happy on that. He still has another two years left on his contract. He said, look, I'm happy to set out the rest of the two years of my contract. So something's going to have to give, but Bill isn't budging at the moment. Yeah, I mean, OK, 600 grand a week is nice, Jerry. Neither you nor I would turn it <laughs> yeah. down. But like, for if, if Bale spends the next two years, he's still you know, of an age where he could produce quality football. If he was to just sit out the next two years effectively, you know, playing a game here or there, what a waste of talent that would be. I agree. I, it wouldn't suit me. And, and when I've been in that situation before, I always wanted to play. But I don't know what sort of a person he is in terms of is it a game of cat and mouse where he's trying to get them to break first? Whatever, I don't know. But um, certainly, you'll see there should, should be some movement when the season's over now mm. in terms of where he's going to go. I, I think if he's going to go, he'll go in the next two or three weeks. Yeah, it feels like it's coming to a head. Well, Real Madrid are going to win a league title. It's Bale second. Jerry, thanks a million. They are. Thanks very much, Joe. That's good to speak to you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Jerry Armstrong there. So. Real Madrid play tomorrow. That should be it, done and dusted. Still, Arsenal 2, Liverpool 1. Ronan Mullen's been keeping an eye on this game. We'll get to Ronan in just one sec. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. It's not quite a TikTok lip sync of Donald Trump, but it's a close second. Gamble responsibly. See Dunleary.net. What is your bliss? To reconnect with amazing scenery and the great outdoors? or to remain indoors with delicious food and great conversation. To reconnect with family and friends. At FBD Hotels and Resorts, we know nothing is more important than to reconnect with your bliss. Nothing feels better or more valuable. FBD Hotels and Resorts, reconnect. When it comes to reviewing your finances, a good place to start is by reviewing your mortgage. It's something few people ever do. But if you never review your mortgage, you'll never know if there might be a better option. That's where the Ulster Bank Mortgage Team could help. Wherever you bank, be sure to talk to us and see if switching could make a difference. Just search Ulster Bank Switch. Ulster Bank. Help for what matters. Over 18s only. Ulster Bank Ireland DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Make the transition from manual paper tasks to digital tracking simple with Blockworks. Our revolutionary software is designed to help your business track, manage and optimise processes with new contact tracing systems to keep staff and customers safe. Arrange your free trial today. Visit blockworx.com Give your home some love this summer with Harvey Norman. We have big deals across our huge range of furniture, beds and homewares with something for every room of your home. Save up to €1,000 on our beautiful range of corner sofas. Support local manufacturing with up to 50% off all Irish-made mattresses and get up to €100 Euro off our huge range of designer mirrors. Shop safely in our spacious stores or online for these deals and more. Love your home again with Harvey Norman, your furniture and bedding specialists. Go! At VHI, our health team online is ready to take care of you, which means no waiting for important services like physiotherapy for your aches and pains or speech and language support. And best of all, they are fully covered on all our VHI plans. To book an online appointment right now, search VHI 
Online Health. Terms and conditions apply. VHI Healthcare DAC trading as VHI Healthcare is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland and is tied to VHI Insurance DAC for health insurance in Ireland. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. When you've done your hammer during PE with Joe, relax, the football's back. Gamble responsibly, see dunleary.net. Now you're uh, welcome back. Don't forget, by the way, on Friday we've got our Know Your Football quiz. It's a rollover prize this week, €2,000 up for grabs. It's happening Friday, 1 o'clock. You can register at quiz.otbsports.com and log on before 1 o'clock Friday. Answer all 15 questions correctly and the cash is yours. Know Your Football brought to you in association with Paddy Power. Check out paddypower.com and visit dunlewy.net for information on responsible gambling, D-U-N-L-E-W-E-Y.net. Roland Mullen, hello. Very well. We spoke nearly three hours ago, Ronan. You've been spending some of that time watching Arsenal 2, Liverpool 1, 79 minutes on the clock. I was trying to explain to people just how bad the Arsenal goals were from a Liverpool perspective. I'm, I'm not even sure I fully did it justice. No, and in the last 10 minutes, just as an example of the pattern of play, I think the last 10 minutes, 92% possession for Liverpool. But as you said, the goals that they gave away, it's kind of... Van Dijk's, for example, his game is almost defined by his nonchalance a little bit, isn't it? Like mm. that languid style where it almost seems too easy for him at times. And if this is one of those examples where he turns the play back to the goalkeeper and gets intercepted by that. In the second for Arsenal, again, Liverpool, the detail of their throw-ins is well covered that they have a throw-in coach and, and all that goes with that. And again, that was their undoing for the second goal. So as much as they played a full-strength team against Arsenal, who made five changes with an eye on the FA Cup semi-final, I presume. Like, and Box just tell me this time and time again. You can have the preparation as like down as you want and all this kind of stuff. But even subconsciously, Liverpool, barring a points record, they're not really playing for much. Mm. And uh, the job of work is done for them, you know? Yeah. And have they generally been on top Liverpool in the game? Yeah. I mean, I know you said about the 92% possession the last couple of minutes. Generally, the two crazy goals aside, have they been on top? Yeah, it's, it's all been one-way traffic. I think Arsenal, right. even shape-wise, they didn't seem to be playing with a, a recognised striker in the second half, at least the bits I saw. So Arsenal probably uh, didn't expect to find themselves in, these posi- in this position. But again, they're not exactly uh, playing for much in the league, but they do have that big semi-final. Man City obviously in action uh, today as well. So those two square off the weekend. For all uh, Van Dijk's brilliance and the notulence that you mentioned, he, he very rarely makes a mistake. You know, the notulence is, is, seems to work quite well for him. I can't think of too many other times where he has, in a position like that, just turned around and passed it to an opposition player and been directly responsible for a goal. Yeah, it's almost the beauty of, of the way he plays. And I can't remember a centre-back with a higher approval rating in the last, probably since Maldini. Do you know, like I think mm. everyone would have Virgil van Dijk, van Dijk rather, as their number one centre back in their team so yeah to see those mistakes is rare but then again I saw one of these compilations I'm sure you've seen them of Harry Maguire and his uh, copious mistakes I think it was set to like Benny Hill music just Mm -hmm. to compare things but then someone posted a reply under that saying you can do this with any player and they put together a a video of Van Dijk making a few errors so I suppose Liverpool fans would be more au fait that like every player makes mistakes but his just seemed to be few and far between yeah so Arsenal have hung in there you know, in a very un-Arsenal way, we can say Arteta is trying to change the culture at the club slowly but surely. This has the look then of a resolute, backs-to-the-wall kind of performance. Yeah, and you'd have to think that maybe the club template is one that Arteta will look at because obviously Liverpool didn't have huge swathes of cash to throw at the project when Klopp arrived. But he, as you said, changed the culture, got a squad that he was happy with and then was able to make those key additions that tipped him over the top. And I'd say in a couple of years, if Arteta's still there, and there's no reason to suggest he won't be if Arsenal give him the backing uh, privately that they're giving him publicly. So I mm. think, again, he'll be hoping that he could probably follow Klopp's line a little bit. I'm sure there's a few teams hoping to do that. Manchester United, similarly, Solskjaer trying to... He cleaned house last summer. And again, all the signings have been good so far. So Arsenal, whether they can open the checkbook, it's obviously defined that club in the 12 years or so since they moved into the Emirates that they haven't been awash with revenue. But... I think every club's in the same boat now in, in that regard. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out for them. Salah's just coming off. Firmino's already gone off for Liverpool, about eight minutes on the clock. Arsenal, as they have done a lot of late under Arteta, are three at the back. It would seem because Arteta doesn't really feel he has two good enough centre-halves to do the job. 
including this evening, David Louise, who kicked off Project Restart against Man City in the most calamitous fashion. He's looking a bit better this evening, I take it. Yeah, and in what in what many games can you say that David Louise has put uh, Virgil van Dijk in the halfpenny place? But that is the case tonight, Joe. And you know, Pat Nevin made the point last night. He is quite a good player on his day. He just has he has these crazily calamitous errors in his locker, and uh, too many to mention is the real issue. But like, you don't get to play for Chelsea and win Champions League with them, and then our PSG obviously as well back to Chelsea and Arsenal. So he's he's presided at the top of football for a decade plus. So there's a reason for that. And you see it today, kind of marshalling things in a yeah. bit of a backs to the walls effort. So uh, Pres presided. He's still got you, you said he pres he's presided. He's been part of it. I don't know if he's presided. We'll say he's been so, part of it. So he has lauded it over yeah. the other twenty one players in that uh, team. Listen, good stuff. Thanks for that update on the game. Cheers. Cheers, Joe. Ronan Mullen there, Arsenal two, Liverpool one. Liverpool on top, as Ronan was saying, but Arsenal are in the lead with seven minutes to go. I was about to say they're going to come away with three points. They are far from uh, that stage with seven minutes to go, plus out of time. We're pretty much done for the evening. OTB AM back with you tomorrow morning, half past seven. Uh, tomorrow night, seven o'clock, John Giles on the show. Also, though, we will have Crystal Palace against Manchester United, Stephen Doyle and Brian Kerr on commentary for that game. As ever, if you missed anything, you can get the Off The Ball app. Just search OTB Sports in your app store and you'll find us there. Tom Dunn is on the way next. Good luck.